So welcome everyone to uh, uh, this episode of TLG Talks. I'm Gene Trowbridge, founding partner of Trowbridge Law Group. And in this series, we're interviewing people who are important to our firm and important to our uh, syndication industry. And I'm happy today to have, and you can see him right here, right behind me, a uh, Paul Asagian, who's a founder of Fortune Builders. And I've been involved with Fortune Builders as a uh, co-educator with Paul many times where we, uh, where we talk about the commercial, uh, commercial real estate education program that they have internally. And I've been lucky enough to be an attorney uh, working on their securities offerings, uh, primarily in the area of multi, uh, multi-family uh, properties. So uh, welcome to you, Paul, and thanks for taking the time out to talk to us today. Gene, thanks for having me on. Okay. Well, Paul, tell us a little bit about Fortune Builders. How did it get started and uh, where are you today in uh, the world of uh, commercial real estate and syndication? Great. You know, I'll share kind of the quick story, but we love all things real estate. Uh, going back to the end of 2003, uh, our first full year in real estate in 2004, we were buying, fixing, and selling homes, and buying and holding rentals in New Haven, Connecticut. That's how we got, got started. Uh, our first company, CT Homes LLC, CT standing for Connecticut, because that's where we started. Um, and we really enjoyed rehabbing properties. Uh, we loved buying rentals. We weren't that educated uh, when we started uh, and had a lot of management headaches, but that grew as we created systems to run our business. That grew to... Uh, people when we go to our local real estate clubs and groups saying, hey, can you share what's working for you? And we, we love to learn and we love to teach. So a couple years into it, we started our real estate education uh, uh, arm, which is Fortune Builders. And that uh, since then, all across the country, Canada and, and beyond, we offered real estate education, coaching tools, systems, and software. And, um, but so we've loved it, we've enjoyed it. That's kind of the short story on a spanning about 16 years. But the main thing from day one, as I shared, we wanted to buy and own real estate. We had a few problems when we started that we had to ask and didn't have the answers for. Now we do, where do you get the money? How do you manage them? How do you reduce your risk profile? Well, uh, with, our, with our national network of investors in our community, once we got familiar and started working with you on how to structure and do syndications, uh, Equity Street Capital is our commercial arm, and that's where we look for uh, commercial properties. We, we love multifamily, uh, retail and office, but we buy commercial properties with uh, obviously a great team and operating partners with professional management in place, but the syndication structure that you really guided us through, uh, done the legal work on, allows us now to, you know, our first deal, our literally first property we bought, Gene, in New Haven, Connecticut, 876 Elm Street, we bought for about 181,000, Than and I. Uh, I'm just talking to our partner, Michael, that you're doing the legal on, and we're getting ready to buy a, over a $60 million multifamily in Texas. Well, we wouldn't have been able to do that without what you're teaching, sharing, and providing through the syndication process. Well, there must be a testimonial in there somewhere when I harvest this <laughs> video. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. So as you alluded to, uh, the principles in, um, in Fortune Builders are syndicators and have a strong uh, background in syndication. Um, I've seen you do uh, 506B offerings. Yep. I've seen you gravitate to 506C offerings, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe we did the 506C first because you knew of your students who were accredited, and then we went into a little more uh, 506B where you were taking people in who had previous uh, yeah. relations with you. That's yeah. probably the way it went. So our, our experience on that topic specifically is we like to do everything above board and try to get everything right. That's why we appreciate working with you. But we did the 506C accredited investors, which again, 
people watching, 506C is accredited investors only, but you can market to anyone. Um, we did that because it's kind of simple. You don't have to overthink when you talk about it and kind of who you talk about it to. But by when we were doing, as we were doing our commercial offerings, our community that not everyone's accredited and they kept asking, how can I participate? And that really, in a good way, forced us to explore and then leverage the 506B offering. So it's a good for those, those people uh, learning, watching and understanding, you can meet the needs of everybody who wants to invest. There's some additional steps and things to be aware of, but that's how we got into 506B because our, our community was raising their hands saying, when can I participate, you know, the non-accredit. So it's been a great tool as well. I was just, before you came on, I was just watching a webinar, an annual webinar by the American Law Institute on, on Reg D. And uh, uh, today, still 90% uh, of all the money that's raised in private placements. And what we're talking about is a million or $1.8 trillion in wow. private placements. Not all real estate, of course, right. but uh, like Google does private placements and whatever, but 90% uh, of the private placement money that's raised is raised in 506B. Uh. Um, the rest of it, I think 99% is in 506. So there's a, a little bit raised in 506C and uh, um, maybe rule 506. 504 a little bit of that but um, 506c has just not taken off the way they thought um, in my business Paul we have newer syndicators who like to come in the into the world with a 506c offering if uh, nothing else to be able to market to be able to build their database for future offerings and then you know, develop the pre-existing substantive relation with the clients and follow up with 506B offerings. But the problem with 506C offerings that you didn't have is track record. If you don't have a track record, yeah. you know, who, who do you not know that's going to send you a $50,000 check? Right. That, that's the question. And so that's really the value of crowdfunding platforms they get out there and they find all these people that are accredited and they have a huge database. And if you can put your, you don't need to, but if you can put your offering on a crowd street or, or real crowd and, uh, and they've kind of pre-vetted all those investors, it's like an MLS. It works, but don't try 506C if you don't have a, uh, a track record. Yeah, agreed. Another area that's, that's gaining some traction and I'm, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but in the regulation A and A plus field, you know, our firm, uh, the firm I was with previously has done a number of notorious reg A uh, plus offerings, the Grant Cardone and, and, and such. And uh, you talked to us about a reg A, but you, uh, you walked away from that for very good reasons. In about 30 seconds, can you tell us why that didn't fit with fortune builders? Yeah, you know, we, we explored, I think it's great, the SEC giving that opportunity and having a tool for uh, raising capital from non accredited with that Reg A offering. Ultimately, it's a, there's additional risk profile to take, there's additional work and um, um, compliance to oversee. And so for, again, for us, when we, we love real estate. When we invest in real estate, it's, it's about capital preservation. And especially when we syndicate, we don't want to, we're not taking risks when we syndicate. We take risks with our own money when we rehab properties and we develop our own properties. Uh, that's a different profile. But uh, for us, the amount of, of uh, administrative, and we have, we have a large community. So every, every offering we'd be doing it. And I've done closed funds. Uh, uh, and open-ended funds. And really the fund model is a decision you have to decide uh, with a Reg A2 if that's something you're choosing from. But for us, it was, we liked and felt, and this is the answer to your question, with a 506 Reg B, you can bring in 35 sophisticated, which, you know, essentially non-accredited. And 
less work, less paperwork. We felt that was fine to meet the need without kicking off and doing uh, a reggae offering with all the additional nuances and, and additional work that you might, that you will have going on that process. Well, I think that was good that you explored that. And it's clear that uh, at least now, as much as I know about your organization and how you have relationships with all your people, that that wasn't necessary. Uh, yeah. Jonathan and I are right now working with a, um, a small group who have uh, 85,000 uh, people uh, subscribing to the YouTube channel on real estate investing. Right. And they don't know any of them. Okay, that's the perfect place for a reggae yeah. plus offering. They don't know the people, they don't have to know the people, most of them aren't gonna be accredited. And the only way they can stand up in front of all those people and pitch a deal is reggae yeah. plus. So that, that, that's a different market, but that really hasn't, uh, hasn't taken hold either. It's 506B, and one of the real reasons it's 506B is, Paul, you've got all these accredited investors in your, in your network, and they're used to going to the subscription agreement and checking a box that they're accredited. All they have to do is self-certify. And if you're gonna do a 506 C, you're gonna to have to send them to some third party to be verified that they're accredited. And they don't wanna do that. They don't need to do that. Why am I doing that now, Paul? I've been investing with you 10 times, you know? So, <clears throat> and a lot of uh, syndicators don't need new investors. My most uh, prolific syndicator, I've done 112 deals with this company since 2014. Uh, they do 506B, accredited investors only. And three years ago, they uh, locked up their database and they don't even take new investors anymore. Right. And all their deals are, you know, three to $7 million and they close out in a day. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty good. But that, that's something that, is a topic for another time, but I can tell you story on story about, in my opinion, this business is about the management of people. In six or seven years of the holding of a property, 40, 50 investors, something's gonna to happen to one of those investors. All is gonna get the call and Paul is gonna to have to deal with that. Yeah. And uh, you know, we, we don't teach you that when we're talking <coughs> NOI <coughs> and debt service coverage ratio. We don't teach you that stuff, but that's, uh, that's what it is. So I know your strategy is you're doing, you're doing retail, you're doing office uh, value added stuff I've noticed. And then you do a lot of uh, uh, multifamily. I, I get the impression that the retail and the office projects you're doing today are more value add than the multifamily you're doing. Is, is that right? Or am I reading that wrong? Um, not exactly like the office, <clears throat> the office that we do is, you know, kind of the Warren Buffett build a moat around an idea. The office uh, acquisitions we've done in the last year, are office towers in the CBD, Central Bus Business District, hard to compete with the product, kind of like a core plus. So <clears throat> again, we're not looking, we're not trying to present a, a two and a half and three multiple or a 25% IRR. It's a stable investment in, in, in a property that you, it's really hard to compete with. We're buying it at a discount of replacement value and it's got in-place income. So our office are, again, um, hard to compete with in terms of its product type. We're very, we're very picky and specifically right now, those office towers have been in uh, Florida in a couple key and emerging markets. Our retail, our retail has a profile same you know you're going to just keep hearing the same principles of oversimplification if we can buy it below replacement value or low basis with in place income but our retail started with uh um really taking advantage of cash flowing properties so we have high cash on cash on our, our retail now these are outdoor retail uh shopping centers and discount shopping centers as well, or what we call second generation retail shopping centers. So, you know, when we, and we talk about all this, this all the time in our business plan and our presentation, because everyone says, well, isn't, 
Amazon going to kill every, everybody in retail. Uh, one statistic when we present, and this is actually just a lesson for those that when you syndicate and you offer a deal, you have to prepare the objections on whatever you're going to be presenting. 10% uh, of all retail sales uh, were online. That's the statistic. That's not a lot. Of the 10% of retail sales that were online, that allocation, only 5% about are what, are what we call pure play retailers, meaning they don't have brick and mortar. So really, when you say is the internet doing all the retail sales, 5% of the current retail, now that'll go up over time, but there's going to be, and again, when we talk about retail, winners and losers, and uh, the, the shopping malls that are closed in, bad location, bad access, uh, those are going to get repositioned and, and go away. But one thing that COVID, right, and this pandemic has taught us, and we've seen it now supported by data, when they lifted the shelter in place order, you know, across the country, people didn't stay home and keep ordering their food in and keep buying everything online. They went out and retail numbers popped up. So our strategy on retail is experiential, meaning you have an experience. You go to get a coffee at Starbucks or go to a restaurant, you go pop in a uh, Whole Foods or, or whatnot or discount shopping center. So anyhow, that's, that's our uh, plan there. Again, it's not a lot of value add. What we do like to do with retail is uh, take, buy something and then take some individual, you know, parcels and units and sell them off as individual triple nets and double our money on a portion of the property. So we have a lot of cash events. They're high cash on cash. But again, from our research and our business plan, it's still a conservative uh, placement of our dollar, preserve our capital. And, um, you know, we have a really strong leasing team and relationships with the national tenants across the country. Yes, I've seen some of those retail transactions where you split off the properties and sell them. And it seems like those smaller properties are, are great assets for the 1031 buyers who are out there because everyone, everyone has bought anything from 2012 to now has all sorts of equity and they're looking to do something. It, 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 have you seen that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, for those people that know, or, or this is new, kind of talking about selling off triple net leases, you get a cap rate compression. So we'll buy a shopping center. Maybe it has two, three, uh, or more uh, pads with say a Chick-fil-A. Uh, we're just selling a Popeye's chicken right now. And you get to buy the whole shopping center at you know, we're buying anywhere from nine or eight, nine, 10 caps, but we're selling these, then we're piecing off like the Popeyes and selling it at a four cap, three and a half cap. And mm -hmm. uh, you just get cap rate compression, you get to bring back dollars and de-risk the deal by giving back a portion of people's equity. Um, so that's what we, that's what we execute. That's what we see. And, and we like that. We have I was just talking to our team. We have one shopping center that we syndicated about a year and a half ago, um, turned over some leases, leased out some vacant space. And now the problem we have to decide on is do we refinance, give everyone their money back and keep holding it? Or do we sell it, capture all the upside profit and the capital and, you know, find something else. But that's, that's when uh, that's when the business plan executes well. That's yeah, that's a good problem to have. That's a good yeah. decision. We have a whole, uh, in the CCIM program, there's a whole day that we spend on talking about how to analyze the uh, sell or hold uh, decision, which is, which is very interesting. I'm going to interject a little humor. I'm, maybe it's not humorous to me, but uh, when the pandemic started and the COVID started and we had to go buy groceries in my family. We weren't allowed to buy them online. I've got a whole bunch of life insurance. So my wife sent me to Ralph's <laughs> to the grocery store. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> Let's send Gene, you know. Maybe we can cash in our chips early. Right. <laughs> so that is that, so funny. That sounds, so uh, one last question here. Um, you guys are certainly in the upper strata of, of syndication, but 
you said your first uh, property on Elm Street was was in $200,000 or less. What advice would you have for a rookie who was trying to get into the uh, into the syndication business? I will tell you that for every two deals that come through our door, and we do a lot of business uh, from existing syndicators, there's one deal that comes from a new syndicator. That's a pretty good relationship. So we have a lot of brand new rookies out yeah. there syndicating. Um, and I'm picking up advice from everyone I interview. So what's yeah. your advice, Paul? Yeah, well, you know, we believe in education. I mean, one of the things we learned early on is the more you learn in your real estate business, the more you're going to earn, right? And so to, to get educated and make that a focus and a routine goal, that has to be part of your mantra. Specifically, getting the education from folks like Eugene and learning and understanding, you know, the first time I heard syndication, it was a foreign word, you know, going back years ago. But when you educate, learn from someone else, um, it, you, you just demystify how to accomplish these goals you might be thinking for yourself. So, you know, the, the two couple of things I'm going to share, two traits of success we've seen because we teach investors and we have for over a decade. You got to ask for help. Uh, you got to ask for help. Successful people ask for help. You're not going to just know everything and, um, and enroll other people, right? Enroll people like a gene, you know, don't, don't uh, read a book on syndication and then try to get, get it done cheap with your local real estate attorney. Cause frankly, it's a, uh, it's a recipe for disaster. They don't understand. You want to have experts on what you want to do and execute. So, um, and then, you know, if you do that, provide value. You gave the example of a client that has a YouTube channel. I think that's great, you know, but provide value first. And then once you've provided value, whatever that means to you and, and your network, once you've provided value, then people are okay with you asking them for something. But if you start with an ask, hey, uh, you know, we don't know each other that well, I haven't delivered any value to you, but do you want to give me your money? That's not going to work, you yeah. know? We didn't start syndicating until we were, oh gosh, from 2006 when we started our, our real estate education. That means we were giving other people information. We didn't start our first syndication until uh, almost uh, true syndication, almost two and a half years ago. So we basically were delivering value through what, how we did it, which was teaching and sharing our systems and how people could win and, and learn this business. And when we did our first syndication, what we found is that we had delivered such value over a long period of time and created a track record. When we asked for something, everyone was very receptive. And uh, that's my advice for new people. You're, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Deliver value. And then, you know, uh, I'm really glad when I see people working with Eugene, but you have to have the right character, integrity, and values when you borrow other, other people's money. The last thing I'll say is don't borrow money you don't intend to pay back. Don't borrow, borrow money that you don't think you would put your own money in a deal. That just means you don't like the deal. So when we do deals that we syndicate, we're putting in uh, uh, our money and considerably uh, a lot of money sometimes because for us, it's our answer for how we preserve our capital and continue to own real estate. When I do deals that have more risk and I'm a little, I want to do, but the risk profile is higher, I don't syndicate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, that's sorry. all great sure. advice. Uh, and, and I will say just to, just to motivate people, you know, from that first property, which we didn't syndicate, you know, 2004, um, 876, Elmo, three family house, you know, my partner and I were borrowed money and got the whatever, 25% down to the last property we syndicated based on if you keep listening to education like this from Gene and, and go down the, go down the continuum. The last property we did was actually the biggest deal we did as a, a outdoor retail shopping center, 880,000 plus square feet. And we bought it for 141 million. Now we wouldn't be able to do that. We raised over $30 million through a syndication. Like, this education, I didn't know it when we started, but we would not have been able to answer how you take down a property like that if you weren't leveraging the tool of syndication, leveraging people uh, uh, like Gene and, and using the, the proper process. So 
it's a very exciting topic and uh, you want to connect with good people like Gene so you do it the right way. You've heard me say when I go through the, the 10 things that you should do, the 10 steps to go out and do your first deal, the first one I always talk about is find a partner. A find a mentor, build a team. That's that's number one. And um, now we're we're at a point where you and I are both doing the same thing. Although you didn't know it at the time, I've known it because I'm a lot older than you are for a long time. Uh, education based marketing. Yeah. Okay. How did I get to to do all the deals I'm doing as a as a securities attorney, uh, going out and talking to people and teaching them. You know, that's it. And so there are two ways to get education, two things you need to know. You need to know the real estate part of it pretty damn well. You've got to have that down. And, and organizations like Fortune Builders certainly teach you the real estate part. And then there's the, sec the securities part. And Fortune Builders take, say, a pretty good run at that, too. But then there are other uh, people who do just exclusively that. So there's two parts to that education. As, and as my book says, the securities part is a whole new business. So you yeah. kind of need to deal with that. Well, Paul, thanks for taking time out of your very busy schedule. Um, I know that uh, the listeners to TLG Talks will be pleased to hear your interview when we broadcast it and go out and have a pleasant day. And someday we'll be back on the podium together, uh, making jokes and teaching people, okay? I look forward to it. Thanks for having me, Gene. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Bye.